Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nau mai, haere mai ki tēnē kōrero. Ka nui te koa ki te kite i a koutou. Uh, tēnē te nunui a Alisa. Uh, he rangatira i a i te ao uh, haora. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Anne-Marie Jutel. I'd like to welcome you all here. I'm delighted to see such a good turnout on such a terribly chosen day. I know a lot of you are between holidays and it's very good of you to come. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague Lisa Sanders, who's really a leader internationally in the work on diagnosis and particularly on the outreach, the telling stories about the understanding of all the social context of diagnosis. Uh, Lisa, I can't wait to hear what you have to tell us today. Welcome. tell you how excited I am to be here in New Zealand. Um, this is one of those places you don't know because you're from here, but in the rest of the world, this is a place that lives large in the imagination, at least, you know, in my imagination and I think in many people. So it's so extraordinary to be here and it's fantastic to be able to spend time with Anne-Marie. And also, it's great to be able to talk about something that I don't this is kind of a different kind of talk for me because it's a little bit more personal than I usually get. But I'm, I'm, I had occasion to start thinking about second opinions and I wanted to share those thoughts with you. Um, um, I write a column for the New York Times Magazine called Diagnosis. And in my column, I tell the story of a single patient who developed some symptoms and it's a little bit mysterious and I sort of follow the path from presentation to the medical establishment to till the diagnosis is made. And I'm sort of interested in interesting diseases, but what I'm really interested in is the sort of mysterious, really, cognitive processes and other kinds of processes that get, get from mystery to solution. Um, I've been writing my column for a long time, for 18 years, and um, in the course of that, I, I get a lot of people who write to me and say, oh, could you help me figure out what's wrong with me? I've had symptoms for so long and no one can tell me, and I've had all these tests and I'm perfectly, everyone tells me that I'm perfectly fine, but I'm not. And, you know, I'm, I'm with uh, the late broadcaster David Brinkley, and I think that everyone is entitled to my opinion. <laughs> but it's not always uh, so easy. I, I don't see patients who live more than 100 miles away from me because I hate to disappoint people, and I'm just not sure that I, traveling to visit me is going to be worth more than 100 miles, really. Um, I tell them when they call me that, you know, I am an internist. I don't solve the cases that I write about, most of them. Some of them I did, but most of them uh, I, I tell the story. I don't, I don't make the solutions, but if they live in 100 miles and they're okay with that, and it sounds like it's something I can help them with, then of course I see them. So I am the second opinion for many people. Um, but for the past few years, I've had reason to think about second opinions in a slightly different context, um, and that's what I want to talk about today. So here's the first rule that we all learn in you know, Medical Speaking 101, start with a patient. So a previously healthy 53-year-old woman goes for a routine screening colonoscopy, and here she is. Uh, um, the middle-aged lady. Um, after I wake up from the propofol, my gastroenterologist says, well, you have cancer, you know. And I said, well, you're, you're kidding, right? And he goes, no. And he shows me this picture. 
And um, I don't think it's subtle, but just in case it's not clear, that big ugly thing there is uh, a tumor. Um, I'm at Yale, I teach at Yale. So I reached out to colleagues that I knew of, had heard of, and respected. Some of them had taught me. And I picked a, a, an oncologist, Jill Lacey, and a surgeon, Ron Salem. Ron Salem teaches, you know, is now emeritus, but, you know, taught everybody who's anybody uh, colorectal surgery. And, uh, and they explained to me what was going to happen. So first, it was going to be uh, a month of chemotherapy and radiation at the same time to shrink the tumor. And then there would be surgery, and then there would be six more weeks of chemotherapy. This is what they were talking about with the surgery. So they would cut off so that little kink there that's faded out is the affected part. Mine was not nearly that big, but uh, that's where it was located. They would take that out, and then they would take the top end, that up there, and pull it through my, the skin of my stomach, and then they would give me a colostomy bag. And I would wear that colostomy bag for a year or so until the surgeon felt that I would be okay to have my guts put back together. Well, really, that was not fine with me. And so I argued about it. I said, you know, don't be ridiculous. I'm 53 years old. I do not need a colostomy uh, bag um, to interfere with my sense of myself as a completely healthy person briefly sidelined by cancer, which is, of course, how we all think of ourselves even in the midst of sickness, we don't think of ourselves as being, well, maybe some people do, but I think many of us think of ourselves as somebody who's just, this is a, this is a sidecar. This is, you know, this is a little, you know, thing with an asterisk that goes down at the bottom of the page. This is not the main event, and I was not interested in having a colostomy bag. Well, you know, Dr. Salem, who I respect greatly, said, well, that is what's recommended because of where it's located and the difficulty of having something at a bend, putting those two things together, it might just come apart and you could get septic and die. And I said, well, to myself, I thought, that eh, doesn't sound like such a bad choice. <laughs> so I realized that I needed a second opinion. Um, I felt, now, has anybody here gone for a second opinion for anything? Has anybody ever been sick enough? So people have told me, my patients, I'm a doctor, I see patients, have told me that they hesitated to get a second opinion because they were worried that their doctor would be mad at them or they felt like they were cheating on their doctor, like there's some sort of, one of, some sort of intimate relationship. And there is, of course, a very intimate relationship between doctors and patients. But I thought, I don't care. <laughs> I felt bad, but not that bad. And I did feel a little bit like I was doctor shopping. You know, when people wrote to me for a second opinion, I know that I was like ninth or 10th or 12th or 15th or 20th on their list. I know that many of the people who call me to see me for a second opinion are doctor shopping. They are looking for a doctor that will tell them what they want to hear. Oh, honey, that was me. I was looking for a doctor who was going to tell me what I wanted to hear, which was I could be cured and not have a colostomy for a year or two. I just, it wasn't part of my self-image, and I just wasn't sure I could get over it. So I wanted to find out if there was an alternative to this bag. Insert tasteless joke about matching your shoes with your bag here. Um, but I just wasn't going to have a part of it. So I found a surgeon at one of the great institutions in the United States for cancer, Sloan Kettering. And 
he was willing to do it. In fact, he was, all of his research was in rectal surgery, colorectal surgery, with a focus on trying to do it as, with as little interruption of real life as possible. So he told me that it was, he would do it. It would be risky, and if he thought it wasn't gonna be successful, I would wake up with a colostomy. But if he could, he would. Um, there's, this was important to me. There's this book um, that if you're a doctor, you probably, if you're a doctor in the United States, you've probably read called The House of God. It's, a, it's kind of a satire set in, uh, written by a guy who did his internship in uh, The House of God, Beth Israel. It's part of the Harvard Medical School health system. And in this, in this novel, which is fantastic and dismal, and I can't reread it because it's still way too close to the truth. The philosopher King Hero is a fellow named the Fat Man. And the Fat Man has a bunch of rules that you hear about through the book, throughout the book. And one of his premier rules is the patient is the one with the disease. I cannot tell you how much walking through the doors of Sloan Kettering to get this surgery affected me. Because that is wrong. You go to medical school so you will never be the person who is walking through the door to get surgery. You know, I mean, it's a kind of a bargain you make with God or fate or whatever it is that if you know about it, then you won't actually have it. But I did have it, and I did walk through those doors, and it was absolutely horrifying. I was now the one in the bed. Uh, something I never wanted to be. But I pulled myself together, and after a month of radiation and a month of chemo, I, and a month walking the road to Santiago, I went to Sloan Kettering for my surgery, and it all turned out just fine. But it did make me think about second opinions. Think differently about second opinions. I mean, everybody sort of thinks, oh, you should get, you tell your mother, your friend, your patient, when they're, somebody suggests they go to surgery, oh, you should get a second opinion. Or if they suggest some sort of radical treatment, oh, you should get a second opinion. Thinking that what you're actually looking for is somebody even smarter than your own doctor who will tell you whether your doctor is right or not. That's how we think of a second opinion. And I realize that that's not always the case and perhaps is never the case. I mean, if, if it didn't fit me, who's it going to fit was my feeling. So, you know, this fella is seeking a, a second opinion. This is how we usually seek second opinions. Um, when, I, when I'm talking about second opinions, I'm really talking about second opinions that patients request. So we think that uh, we think that that a second opinion is for the patient, but actually doctors have been getting second opinions from each other for a really, really long time. Um, um, perhaps the most well-established kind of second opinion that doctors get is something called a tumor board. I don't know if you have them here, but um, everybody who gets diagnosed with cancer, even me, they have their slides presented to a bunch of pathologists and, and surgeons and radiologists, and then they, they discuss what the treatment ought to be. That's why Dr. Salem could, said to me, could look at me straight in the face and go, this is the way it's done here, because he discussed it with the tumor board, and that is the way it's done here. Um, but it's not just in, in tumor boards. I mean, in pathology, um, second opinions are routine, and in some institutions, they're absolutely mandatory, and it can make a difference. Uh, in one study of patients who were seeking a second opinion at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, which is um, a fantastic institution, there were over 20,000 cases reviewed. These are cases where patients, if you call up the Mayo Clinic and say, I want to see a doctor, 
they'll tell you what to do and they'll tell you you need to send us all of your records and all of your slides and all of your imaging and then they'll review them so that when you come they're already up to speed on your case. And so they looked at 20,000 uh, cases where people sent in slides to the pathologist and the, the Mayo Clinic uh, pathologist reviewed the slides uh, before they saw the patient. So in these 20,000, the, the number or the percentage of slides in which the Mayo Clinic doctors came up with a different answer than the doctors who saw before was a very encouraging 1%. Uh, 1%, 1 they found, were different, where their determination about what was going on was different than the first doctor. That was about 457 cases. And in each of these cases, the discrepancy affected either the prognosis of the patient or the treatment that they should get. Um, um, so 1%, that's pretty good. That really, to me, suggests that that is why you seek a second opinion, is to get somebody to reassure you that what your doctor told you was right, so you can go back and get what everybody thinks you should get. Other studies have found less uh, agreed less often. Um, up to 15% of the time there were some disagreements, and so in those, it raises a question of who's right, right? If you have two doctors, the first, the first doctor sees you and, and says, uh, you have cancer, and the second doctor sees you and says, eh, I don't know. Who's right? We don't actually know the answer to that. In the Mayo Clinic, those 20,000 cases, a small number of the 457 a um, hundred of them were followed up about a year later. And <clears throat> in most of the, in 73, 73 cases, the diagnosis was the same. But in 13 cases, it was a different diagnosis. I don't know what happened to the other 15%. <clears throat> but so maybe in 15% of the cases, a second look said, oh, the first guy actually did get it right. So that's a concerning discrepancy. Um, it's pretty good, but not perfect. So radiologists also get mandatory or voluntary second opinions. I mean, virtually every big academic institution requires their radiologists to have somebody else look over their, their slides or their films, um, in part because of the volume of what they see and, and because if you're going to get sued, it's going to be over a diagnosis. So. How well do the radiologists do? So in the literature, when people estimate um, things like pathology and radiologists, they think, well, it's really a tiny minority that are wrong, that they're actually really, really good. And they say, you know, less than 5% are in error. So what do the built-in uh, second opinions say? Say they do pretty good. In one study that looked at, again, over 20,000 films, um, they found a discrepancy about 3% of the time. So that's pretty good, and that's films of all varieties. But we know that some radiology is a lot better than other kinds of radiology, and mammograms, they're, you know, they're the worst, so, because there's a lot of, because they're not very good studies, um, and because breast cancer is common. And so when you get uh, people who, are, who specialize in mammography, they disagree with each other 10%, 10 to 20% of the time. And about a third of the times when they disagree, they're disagreeing with themselves, right? So they're looking at the same film that they saw before, but now they have a very different take on it. So, so it's, not, it's not as perfect as you might hope. But that's when doctors ask for second opinion. What happens when we 
us patients, I mean, putting myself in the patient position, um, what happens when we ask for a second opinion? Um, I think there are three questions that people go to seek a second opinion for. First is, is this the right diagnosis? Second is, is this the right treatment? And third is, way before that, what do I have? Or the way I see it, what do I really have? Because a lot of those people have already gotten a diagnosis that their doctor is satisfied with, but they are not satisfied with. They feel like it doesn't really describe what they have. Given the frequency of second opinions, um, and it's gotten to be much more frequent, it's twice as uh, people ask for, between the 1980s and the 1990s, which was the last time this was looked at, you know, the number of, the percentage of people uh, who are seen at a doctor's office um, has, and ask for a second opinion has doubled. So it was like a piddling, like five or 10%, and now it's about 10 to 20%, depending on what, where you look at it. And given the frequency of second opinions, it's really important to know whether and to what extent these second opinions improve the quality of patient care or whether it just improves the patient's satisfaction with what doctors tell them. So most of the studies, this is not, this is not well described in the literature. Um, and most of the studies have been done on the first question, um, is this the right diagnosis? Um, uh, most of the work has been done with patients who, like me, were given a cancer diagnosis and wanted to make sure that the diagnosis was right and that um, the treatment was right, more or less. In one large study, the second opinion agreed completely or had just minor discrepancies in over 80% of the cases. But 16% of the time, there was a major disagreement. Um, in another study, this one of men looking for a second opinion after getting a diagnosis of prostate cancer, there was a change in treatment but not in diagnosis 40% of the time. And of those who got a different treatment recommendation, these are men who had prostate cancer that was early stage, not spread outside the capsule. So this is a very controversial area. Once it's spread, you know, all bets are off. But once, while it's still in the capsule, it's not clear which way it's gonna go. And it's like, the pathology they have is kind of like mammograms. Maybe it's a good way of knowing, maybe not. And so of the people who got a different recommendation, where there's a discrepancy between the second opinion and the first opinion, the second opinion almost always recommended much more aggressive treatment. You know, and this is, uh, to me, this seems like a bad thing. You know, I mean, prostate cancer, the treatment of prostate cancer has been very controversial. It's a, a really maiming surgery that causes impotence and incontinence in men sometime for the rest of their lives. So going to surgery sometimes makes patients feel better. I can't bear to have that in my body, but it may not make the rest of their lives better, and it may not have any effect at all on their mortality. Um, when you look into my area of expertise, which is internal medicine, many more of those patients are actually looking for help with the diagnosis. Um, uh, the symptoms that are most frequently associated with these kinds of searches are those that are the hardest to diagnose to begin with. The two most common um, are uh, on fatigue, very difficult, and abdominal pain, also difficult. Um, in research done uh, in this area, one study found the second, this type of second opinion of these sort of vague uh, symptoms, 90% of the time, they either made no diagnosis or agreed with the original diagnosis. But 70% of the time, they had a different treatment plan. Um, what does that mean? I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really sure. 
Who seeks this kind of second opinion? Well, women, middle-aged women. I mean, me. That's who it is. That's who seeks this kind of opinion. Middle-aged women, the average age is uh, 54. Um, and, and most of the patients who were seeking these, these uh, diagnoses had been suffering with their symptoms for years. But what's interesting and strange and a little bit disappointing to me is that none of these studies really looked at whether the first opinion or the second opinion or the third opinion or the fourth opinion was right, or whether taking the second opinion advice made any difference at all about whether these people lived or died or got sicker or got better. There are ways to check this, and they've never been done. I don't know why this is exactly. It seems to me it would be obvious that you would want to know. I think the assumption is, of course the second opinion is better. Duh. But there are lots of things that we thought, duh, about where we were completely wrong. I think they're difficult, but I also think that, and maybe this is just my cynical self, we have the worst president in the planet right now and makes, it brings out the cynicism in all of us. But maybe it's because um, second opinions are an important source of income for a lot of institutions and that's just getting bigger. And so nobody really wants to know whether it's helpful or not. And everybody, if you've ever met a doctor, you might know that humility is not a strong suit, not even among internists. And I think everybody, everybody who's a doctor thinks that they are by far the smartest doctor in the room. So of course, their diagnosis is the right one. In any case, it's something that really needs to be, uh, needs to be figured out. But it hasn't been. And now there are, there are, there are companies that, have, that are, are set up just to give second opinions. This is, this is probably the most well-known. It's called Best Doctors. Um, and they're just a professional second opinion organization. They're not alone. I mean, probably the most famous one of these is the Mayo Clinic. You know, they have a, the Mayo Clinic is this enormous institution the size of a city in this little town of Rochester, Minnesota. You know, the number of patients that are from the region is tiny, minuscule, really. Everybody else comes from all over the world to get opinions at the Mayo Clinic. And other people have decided that to follow up with that, Johns Hopkins has recently started a second opinion, a tele-second opinion, a distance second opinion service. So has uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. These uh, distant, you know, they can do, give you a second opinion from a distance. We still don't know whether a second opinion does anything besides make the patient like me feel a lot better about the choices that they've made. Um, but that's where we stand now. It's a growing industry, and we, we don't actually know very much about it. Um, one of the things that grew out of my own experience with second opinions is I started writing a different column. I, I continue to write my diagnosis column, but I started writing a new column because I thought, I don't know, I thought maybe, maybe real people had something to offer in the way of second opinions. And um, so I wrote this column called Think Like a Doctor. And in this column, I would tell the story of a patient with their symptoms. This was the story of a painter who uh, developed these headaches and then started having strange visual changes and personality changes. So I would tell the story right and give all the information, notes, test results, imaging, um, anything that anybody could want, right up until the point where the doctor was going to make the diagnosis. When I'd given the, the reader everything that the doctor had or everything that was important that the doctor had, I'd stop and say, what do you think it is? And then people would write in like hundreds of people would write it here. This one, 219 people wrote in with uh, what they thought was going on with this painter. And then the next day in the afternoon, I would 
write the solution and say who, you know, who, what the right answer was and who was the first person who came up with it. And uh, this, was, this was why his wife was worried. He went from painting these lovely pastoral scenes to these much darker, weirder scenes. And he had, he had a, a dural fistula. It was really very dramatic. He got fixed, and he's all fine. But what I saw was that you know lots of people were interested in engaging in in this practice. You know, to me, this was a Sherlock Holmes story. You know, except my thought was, if you could see this the way I could see this, you would think it was cool. And so this was my invitation to people to try and see it the way I saw it, the way a doctor or a nurse or anybody who sees patients might see it. It was mostly medical students, nursing students, veterinarian students who got the right answer. Probably they have the most time and the most knowledge. But you know, there were more than one time when it was just a patient who goes, oh yeah, no, my aunt, my aunt Sue had that. Or, you know, and of course, that's how doctors make diagnoses too. They recognize it. Oh yeah, I had a patient who had that before. Um, so it's, to some extent, it's the same kind of practice. Um, my goal, or one of the things that I always wanted to do with this, was to, I was so impressed with the quality of the thought that came from these readers who decided to devote, you know, I mean, I, they could have been doing the crossword puzzle, they could have been working, they could have been doing their bills, but instead they were actually looking through these notes and trying to figure this out. And I thought that was extremely cool. And I thought, I wonder if we could recruit these people to diagnose people who didn't have a diagnosis. All of the patients that I wrote about in this series for five years, they all had diagnoses. Um, and so I was able to give the answer the next day. Guess what? This is what they had. Isn't that cool? And this is how they, everybody figured it out. So I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do it on patients who didn't have a diagnosis? Um, I never quite got there. But somebody else did. So this guy, this is, a, this is a company. They make money. A company called CrowdMed. Um, Organized, started by a guy named Jared Heyman. And he called me before he launched his business to say, you know, this is the stepchild of your think like a doctor. I owe this all to you. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> what have I done? Um, and so they, like doctors themselves, so this has been going on for about a year, and they have done they have published studies about how successful they are. But of course, like doctors, they haven't looked into what the patient really had. They haven't tried to say, here's what the, our crowd says, and this is what we think they had. They only ask the patient if the patient is satisfied with the information that the crowd provided them. Not surprisingly, they're very satisfied. You know, um, I don't know if it's right. Um, and I got to be quite alarmed. Um, there's a radio, does anybody listen to podcasts in here? I listen to, I'm addicted to them. So there's one called Reply All. Does anybody know this one? It's about tech. It's fabulous. Anyway, they were doing uh, a story about crowd med, and they called me up and they said, we're just wondering if you could uh, come on the radio and explain the diagnosis that this woman had. I said, well, tell me about the patient. I said, well, she's a middle-aged woman who had uh, uh, pain in her neck that radiated up into her head and blurry vision and maybe a little bit of a facial droop. And her neck really, really hurts. And she was diagnosed with sternocleidomastoid syndrome. So the sternocleidomastoids are these muscles in your neck. And I said, well, Gosh, sounds to me like she has a carotid dissection. Did she get, what did the CT scan show? Oh, she didn't get a CT scan show. So she doesn't know. I said, well, I do think that she ought to get a CT scan um, and see what it says. Because of course, not everybody dies or strokes out if you have a carotid dissection. Some people do fine. 
And she did fine. She got a CT scan. It didn't show anything. Do I think she didn't have a carotid dissection, that she had sternocleidomastoid syndrome? I do not. Um, so I called up Jared and I said, don't, why don't you program your system to have red flags, you know, things that would go, that would catch somebody's attention so that if somebody like this woman who really needed what could be, it wasn't for her, but what could be a life-saving intervention, she could get it. And he said, yeah, well, we thought about that, but that doesn't really scale. You can't really take care of millions of people if you're going to be that detail-oriented. So I, I'm sort of mad at my stepchild. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure he did it the right way. But I do think there's a way to do it. And I finally got a chance to do that, to try a different way. So I have a series that's going to come on Netflix called Diagnosis. It's based on my column. Um, except in this, we take un patients who are in search of a diagnosis, and then I present them the way I did with my Think Like a Doctor column. I give the studies, I, I read all of their records, give the pertinent findings, and put it out there in the world to see if the New York Times crowd could offer some possibilities. Because what is it that you're really looking for? in this setting. What you're looking for is something, well, what people usually say is somebody who thinks outside the box. That's when people call me. They say, we're looking for somebody who thinks outside the box. I guess that's a good thing. But what they really want is a very broad differential. And so this is the broadest possible differential. I'm going to show you just one small clip from one of the, one of the ones that's going to air. I've never done this before. I've edited this, and hopefully it will run, and I don't have to just narrate a still picture. So we'll see. So this is Sadie, and I'll let her show you a little bit of her story. No audio. Ah, what did I tell you about the audio? It's always the audio that does you in. OK. Terry, no audio. Okay. Com okay. Um, oh, sorry, nothing on. to be done. On the computer, it's a PC. Oh. Enough. Help. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything to be done or not? Oh no, you don't know what to do. Okay. okay. You have to narrate. Sorry. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. Uh, where are we? Yep, there we go. We oh, got there. it. Oh, this is crowdsourcing. Yes, see? Was that perfect? It was all, it was a, um, a sorry, there we go. It was all part of the demonstration, wasn't it? Wait, okay, wait. You have to go, wait, go back. And make and it louder. Louder. Oh, wow. Jeez, it's great. Block your ears, Thank guys. Thank you, crowd. Sadie Hanna Gonzalez. That's her name. And I'm seven, and I live in Queens. Continue on Grand Central Parkway for three miles. It's okay. Mama, her baby skill got broken. No. What happened to it? You can fix it. Sadie has a seizure disorder, which you'll find out about, that's yeah, been really cool debilitating. But we have to be careful if we have ticks, right? Yeah, but this, there's not deer in Flushing Meadows. Let's go. <laughs> Woo! Sadie, if you feel like you got wobbly, just stand still, OK? <laughs> Sometimes it happens to my leg or my toe. 
Every time I walk, I almost fall down. When you have a mouth seizure, can you talk? No, not really. I try. Tell me about that. But I just clap. When they hear me, they come. You have them one now? You okay, Sadie? Anyway, so that's one of our patients. Um, and so we showed a little bit, not this, but we showed a little bit of film and I showed, uh, and I summarized her story from her records. And then, you know, hundreds of people wrote in. You know, a lot of times those people were just, you know, wishing the mom well and offering thoughts and prayers and, you know, sympathy. But there was a good portion of them that also made very thoughtful suggestions. They weren't all right, obviously. You know, it's not like they all said, she obviously has blah, because if it was that obvious, she'd have a diagnosis by now. But it allowed her family and her doctors to think about it more broadly. Now, let me just say, doctors did not necessarily welcome this. Surprise, but the families did. And I think that's really, given how little we know about second opinions, that's really all you can hope for, is that you give the family, the patient, the tools to move forward with what's, uh, with what's happening next. So I think she has a diagnosis. I can't tell you because Netflix would have to shoot me and everybody in the room, um, but because they're very crazy secretive. But, you know, I think that having all these other voices was helpful for the family and then maybe helpful for the doctor. So, what is the role of a second opinion? I don't think we really know. I mean, I'm going on the idea that it's there so that patients can find out more about what's going on with them from a bunch of, from different mouths and different minds. And as somebody who saw all the suggestions that came in, let me just say most of the suggestions didn't really make sense. You know, if you really knew medicine and you really read the case, you would realize that, you know, most of them were not right. But there was a core, in each of these cases, there was a core of really smart, thoughtful takes that were worth investigating. And I think when you don't have a diagnosis, that's really all you can ask for, is having a different perspective, somebody with a different take on what's going on. So that was my, that's been my journey in second opinions. You know, I realized from my own experience that it does, it's not like going to God to find out what the right answer is. It's a little bit more complicated and a little bit less effective. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions.